Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Photographs in the Archive, Photo Album Preservation. I have just a few housekeeping notes to mention before we get started. Uh, one, if you have any sound or technical issues today, please let me know in the chat box with a direct message, and I'll do my best to help you out. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and the recording, along with a PDF version of the slideshow and some additional resources, will all be sent out to all registrants within the next week or so. And finally, we do have some built-in time at the end to answer any questions that may come up, but please feel free to type them in the chat box at any point throughout the presentation. And before we get started, I just wanted to share a little bit about the Documentary Heritage Preservation Services for New York program for those of you who may not um, know us very well. DIPSNY, as we like to call it, is a collaboration between the New York State Archives and the New York State Library with services provided by the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. DIPSNY is a statewide program that provides free planning and education services to support the vast network of collecting institutions, such as archives, libraries, historical societies, museums, and other organizations that safeguard and ensure access to New York's historical records and library research materials. DIPSNY services include archival needs assessments, preservation and condition surveys, strategic planning assistance, and access to a variety of educational programs, such as this webinar. To learn more about our services, please visit dhpsny.org. And with that, I pass this along to today's presenter, Barbara Lemon, Senior Photograph Conservator at CCHA. Hey, good afternoon. Um, on my title slide is an image from a recent story in the New York Times about Koo Stevens. He runs cross country to honor his tribe and the Paiute forebears, and this year became state champion in Nevada. His family is documenting his career in albums, which are by definition a series of photographs collected by an individual or family in the form of a book. When is something a scrapbook, a photo album, a photo book, and when does it matter? Uh, they may vary in intention, context, and details of the structure, but these are all... Okay. Hello, we're back. I apologize for not advancing my slides. This will make a lot more sense now. Um, so we're talking about photograph albums versus scrapbooks and photo books. So this is an image where a family is creating photograph albums to, to document the career of their, of their son, Ku Stevens. Um, so in general, these are all bound materials with broadly similar issues, these three types, and my talk will focus on the preservation of photograph albums, but I hope you feel that you'll um, understand the preservation of these other categories better at the end of the webinar also. Although I'm speaking alone, I feel like this is a joint presentation. CCHA's photograph conservators, Richard Homer and Amber Hares, advised me and contributed core content. I also wish to thank Olivia Permanis, retired book conservator who educated many, many conservators in understanding and caring for albums. Okay, just a moment. I'm having technical issues at my end. Okay, a scrapbook is a blank book in which items are collected and preserved, sometimes with the goal of compiling information. Hence, the contents are often newspaper clippings, photographs, mementos. They tend to be constructed of and hold poor quality materials, poorer quality than albums, but there is still considerable overlap. If a scrapbook contains mostly photographs, we often move it into the category of album. The popularity of scrapbooking is not a new phenomenon. Keeping a scrapbook was a popular 19th century pastime, especially for women and children. The Oxford, I know that's very sexist, but <laughs> it took us straight from the Oxford English Dictionary, which suggests 1854 is the earliest known date of the word scrapbook, although other methods of collecting mementos were popular since the 18th century. Printed scraps are also made in, were also made and sold specifically to hobbyists, and I think this, this still goes on now. So is this a page from a scrapbook or an album? This collage of watercolor and albumin prints was created by Mary Georgiana Caroline in the mid 1860s. Maybe whether it's a scrapbook or album depends on whether she knew the sitters. Photograph albums began to be made shortly after the invention of photography in the 1840s. 
Uh, these conservation students are examining a classic postbound album with black paper pages from the earliest 20th century that holds gelatin silver prints. And I'm sure you've all seen one like this. I'm going to talk a little bit later about those black paper pages. So a photo book is a book, with or without text, where the work's primary message is carried by the photographs, or that they make, they make a significant contribution to the overall content. In the digital age, are these bound objects that are printed online from your digital files photo books or albums? Scrapbooks and albums are usually unique items that are put together by individuals, so I have, would have to say the above are photo books, but, but I could be persuaded otherwise. I'm going to proceed to the structure and components of photograph albums. This will help you understand their vulnerabilities and preservation needs. The book structure itself is the cover and text block or book block and how it is constructed. The book block is the leaves, which are typically flexible paper or boards in photo albums. How they are connected to each other and to the cover often determines whether the album functions well and if it lasts. There are two general binding styles. Uh, traditional, which is sewn or unsewn, where the leaves are permanently bound together and the book block is held to the cover with cloth hinges. And the second is loose leaf. And these are where the covers are separate from the leaves. The perforated pages are held together at the spine edge and the leaves are generally removable. I'm going to get into more detail in these in the preceding slides. Also, I wanted to point out that one of the handouts is the terrific reference glossary of terms relating to photograph albums by Richard Horton and annotated by Weissman Preservation Center conservators. He's one of the key researchers and um, educators besides Olivia Permanis in the history of albums and book structures in our field. Around 1840, people were already putting photos into sketchbooks that they had purchased off the shelf in stationary stores or ones they had commissioned by, from a binder to their specifications. Uh, there's some examples of the lower right here that are up by Lewis Carroll. Uh, generally, these had leather or cloth covers. They consisted of high quality paper pages that were sewn together in groups of leaves. Uh, a leaf is the entire sheet and the page is either one side or another. So I have two pages per every leaf. Um, these pages, so the leaves, uh, sorry. This, so the, this thin paper page that we have in these early bindings worked for the early thinner and more flexible photographs, uh, those that were unmounted or didn't have binders such as salt of paper or albumin. If uh, thicker content was included, the album would not close and the binding would be stressed. So later in the 19th century, compensation guards were added to address this issue. Um, a guard is the thickness that was added to the leaf um, <clears throat> that it was equivalent to the thickness of the photographs. The diagram shows several ways of doing this by folding the spine edge of the leaf to double its thickness, as in figure five, which is a returning guard, <clears throat> or incorporating additional pieces of paper into the text block. The latter might be between the leaves or wrapped around the spine edge, as you can see here. Stubs were also emerging. These gave flexibility at the spine to heavier papers. The next iteration, the guarded leaf with stubs, was necessary when mounted photographs became popular. Uh, with a guarded leaf, the pages are not gathered or sewn together along the spine in groups of leaves. Um, this is often necessary due to the thickness or lacks of, lack of flexibility in the page. And generally, a cloth hinge connects each leaf to the next and the outer leaves to the cover. You can see how well the structure functions in this um, image, that is, until the inexpensive materials age poorly. Here the leaves on the boards are decorated, here the leaves are bored with decorated papers on both sides. The photograph fits into a hollow chamber in the board. Uh, the viewing window in the outer papers is slightly smaller, which holds the photograph in the page. The pages office have hand decorated images or printed borders or other designs on them. Um, I encounter accordion or concertina bindings once in a while, which is why I want to mention them. Uh, this is a more common style in Japanese book binding, and I've fa found many that have um, decorative lacquer covers, like you can see on the one on the left. So we're getting into the time where albums were generally commercially made. Those The sewn ones tended to be handmade, um, whether, you know, uh, and, and uh, in one-offs. 
made to order. But then there was such a huge demand as photography boomed and people started collecting them later in the 19th century that uh, a lot of companies started making albums. They you know, they might have had some handmade components, but they tried to commercialize it as much as possible. Um, but they often were much more decorative than those early albums with elaborate decorations inside and out. You can see your covers of tooled leather, velvet, uh, covered with celluloid with a printed design. They might have elaborate metal furniture, which is the straps and clasps, the medallions, metal and glass bosses, which would be on the underside and prevented the cover from sliding and abrading on the table. The clasps would keep the binding closed and served as an alarm, served in as alarm bell <laughs> if you tried to stuff too much into the structure. Um, the next category is loose leaf bindings. Although I think of loose leaf bindings as being the product of Alphys culture in the 20th century, uh, they go back to 1880 or earlier. Albums with binding styles in this category outnumber all of the sewn bindings that I've encountered. And almost all of these are manufactured, although I will show examples of handcrafted covers. The keys, the key to loose leaf bindings is the pages are independent. They can often be added or removed and the sub covers themselves are separate components. This also means that they're generally easier to disbind and reconstruct for preservation. Um, this version has strings or ribbon threaded through holes that are pre-punched in the cover and leaves. Often a metal telescoping post reduced the chance of the string cutting through the paper pages. And this one has the infamous black paper. So at the start of my career, everybody was really afraid of this paper and a lot of albums were disassembled and the photographs removed because it was thought that these, all this paper was really poor quality. Um, it's not hot best quality. It certainly doesn't meet international standards that we like to uh, um, apply to our products now. But generally, you, you just take, take a look and see if it's not damaging the photographs you know, leave them on the page. Really, the sometimes these pages are extremely brittle and powdery, and um, the album needs to either be uh, housed differently and kept away from other materials, which it might contaminate, or it needs to be disassembled. But all black paper is not problematic, which was a great thing to kind of share with the field as we as we found that out. Here in this, um, this object, the metal posts screw together in, it's called a screw post or Chicago post. And there are different lengths usually available to permit the addition of more leaves to your album. Uh, this album from Tennessee State University was put together for state representative Clarence B. Robinson in the late 1970s. And the handmade cover, this is about four feet long, shows the state bird and flower. You can see the hinges on it so that the cover can be lifted and you can actually see the three or four posts, the three posts that go through the cover and go through all of the pages. The third most common mechanical structure is the ring binder. We, we've all seen this, this is not really historic. I'm afraid I, I could not find a start date or origination date for this. Um, it typically holds paper pages with a plastic cover sheet or plastic pocket pages and is tend to be, to be used not for historic or family um, materials, but more for by photographers for their negatives or institutions using it for documentary materials, but doesn't mean that it can't be part of a photograph album or part of a reformatting a photograph album. This last category is comb, spiral, and coil bindings. These can be metal or plastic. Uh, these albums may be designed for photographs, but I've seen many examples where an office product was adapted by a, a creator. The pages are not always removable in some of these. You can think about your classic like spiral bound notebook, uh, but there are exceptions and there's a million different versions of these. So the next part of understanding albums, now that we've talked about the structure and the leaves, is the attachment to the page. So the two main categories are adhesive or paste down, where the um, photograph is either mounted overall or locally, which is called tipped in, or non-adhesives or slip in. So I'm going to give some examples of both of those. So overall adhesion is usually a starch 
um, adhesive or protein was used initially to hold thin photographs to album pages of heavy paper or board. Early photographs um, were very, very thin and you needed some way to secure them completely, hold them flat for viewing, but also to give them added support when you would turn the page. However, distortion is common over time due to aging of the adhesive or of the photographs. In this case, you can see where the albumin binding, oops, Sorry. The albumin binder is shrinking and it's strong enough to cockle these board pages. So in that example at the bottom, you can see that the pages nest nicely together in the binding and they actually take up less space this way than if they were um, disbound. We call these potato chips to cheer ourselves up when we encounter something like this. Photographs that have been tipped into albums from the start um, although it is more common with unmounted prints in the 19th century, sorry, I'll start again. Um, here, the next category is things that are tipped into albums. And this could be a variety of adhesives could have been used for this. In this case, it's rubber cement, and we all know that rubber cement eventually fails. Some of these adhesives are high quality, still in really good condition, but more often we get failure of the adhes adhesive or some kind of local distortion or staining of the prints. I mean, tipping things in rather than mounting them overall. Neither one is entirely preferable and often it's a historic decision. So this is a fun digression. I learned about this about 10 years ago. This is one of the earliest scrapbook or album patents and it was uh, created by Mark Twain in 1873. It's, I thought of, sort of think of it as, uh, it's, a, it's an adhesive mounting method, but is a precursor to magnetic albums. So I'm going to paraphrasing Clemens patent. He said the leaves are entirely covered on one side or both, um, or um, there's adhesive applied at intervals that is either mucilage or some other suitable adhesive. In either case, the scrapbook is, so to say, self-pasting, as it is only necessary to moisten so much of the leaf as will contain the piece to be pasted in. As an avid scrapbooker, Twain tired of hand gluing his life into books and figured his fellow scrapbookers felt the same way. After acquiring the patent, Twain successfully marketed and sold the invention. And as of 1885, an article claimed that he had made $50,000 on his scrapbooks compared to $200,000 for all of his, the literature that he produced. And I actually found an example um, in the collection of Fisk University. This is a, scrap, a scrapbook um, documenting the work of, um, of uh, they, sorry, Julius Rosenwald, who helped to create a system of public schools for black Americans. And you can see that it's got adhesive dots overall on the pages. Um, the contents are still secure, but the poor quality paper has caused fading of the photographs, unfortunately. Um, strangely enough, where the silver images are less faded or protected where the little dots are, I don't know if you can see the vertical lines where the image still looks like black and white running through the prints on the right, uh, whereas surrounding areas are faded. So that just shows that the, the adhesive was better quality than the page, which is not uncommon. I mean, scrapbook and albums have a variety of components. Um, I would say that scrapbooks are better constructed in general than albums, but um, there's so many exceptions. So here we have an example of a magnetic album, the album that belongs to me. It's a trip to Italy. And on the right is the album today. And on the left there, it is 15 years ago when the album was already 10 years old. So that I should, talk, I should go back and tell you what a magnetic, magnetic album is. You're probably all familiar with them. You've got a page that's covered with dots of a pressure sensitive adhesive. It's usually an acrylic. Then you've got a cover sheet and the, it's described as magnetic because when you put the photos in and lay the cover sheet down, it sort of acts like a magnet and holds them into place. Um, but the adhesive is a really known back, bad actor with inherent vice and it tends to, it darkens over time. It's a rubber-based adhesive. I was wrong, it's not acrylic, it's rubber-based. The cover sheets can be poor quality and often the adhesive fails and photographs come out or they become really strongly bonded. 
uh, but there was some wonderful research done by a former student of mine on magnetic albums that kind of um, helped to elucidate what was going on and some approaches to caring for them. So she found out that the paperboard leaves are also as poor quality as the adhesive. Also, the cover sheets tend to be a PVC, which gives off acids and plasticizer. If the cover sheets are polypropylene, they tend to distort. And this is an example from a collection at the University of Delaware. So you've got physical and chemical deterioration going on. So a lot of people disbind these and take the contents out. I honestly, even including these albums that Amber researched, I've rarely seen deterioration caused by the albums unless the cover sheet is starting to distort. So we'll go back to the adhesive. Um, you may, perm may firmly bond the photographs in place so that it's difficult to remove, but you don't necessarily need to remove them to preserve the album. Uh, so if the cover sheets are wrinkling or sticking, you can remove those and add a new cover sheet, maybe made of uh, like just with interleaving of mylar or um, some other kind of, of um, cover sheet, a new cover sheet to replace it. But you don't need to automatically disbind these. I mean, they're unique items, just like all photograph albums, and you have to have a really serious discussion before you take them apart. An alternative would be to store them into cold storage, which would slow the deterioration of all the components. And we'll talk a little bit more about that under the environmental section. So I mentioned cover sheets. Here's an example of one. It's actually a scrapbook. It's not an album that came into the Conservation Center that got the, uh, the name Pickle Book. And these cover sheets were, so this, this is a spiral bound like scrapbook with black paper pages. The cover sheets were cellulose acetate, which is it naturally deteriorates, shrinks, and off gases vinegar smell. So our conservator is wearing a vapor absorbing um, uh, mask to protect her while she's working with this because the off gassing of the, of the acetic acid was so strong that it was really could uh, be a health hazard. Anyway, uh, all these materials, the cover sheets were removed, the objects removed from the album, and the, so the whole thing ne necessitated being reformatted, but sometimes it's just possible to replace the cover sheets. So we're back to uh, attachment, and we're in the category of non-adhesive or slip-in. There's three main types here. We've got slots in board pages, slits in pages and pocket pages and that doesn't tell you very much you really need to see some pictures but you I mean you can see the advantage to after seeing problems with using these adhesives why you might want to go with a non-adhesive method um, there's a less chance of distortion you could swap the photographs in and out if someone went out of favor or there were a new celebrity you wanted to include like a new president in your 19th century album so, uh, and a lot of these were designed to accommodate specific formats of photographs like postcards, and as well as those um, mounted photographs, the carte de visites that we saw earlier. So yeah, one of the main types of photograph was cabinet cards and carte de visites that were used for the, um, the non-adhesive mounting. And this, we call it slots and boards, and they are either slots in the pages as you can see on that image on the left so you could insert the photograph or there was uh, the slot was at the bottom of the board page as on the right i'm actually going to show you a brief video about how to remove these photographs this is something that people ask me all the time they really want to see the back carte de visites and cabinet cards which are standard size mounted photographs usually um Carte de visites are albumin. Cabinet cards can be other printing out processes or albumin. Um, they want to see the backs where there's could be inscriptions or there's um, photographers, a, a printing printed image showing the photographer's studio, often be beautiful aesthetic designs. And uh, the whole image is not visible in the window that's in the albums, um, even on the recto. So these are just the simple tools you might need. I'm going to go let just give this to you as reference and then show you the video. So first you want to remove any dust. 
a lot of the this technique is avoiding abrasion of the photograph and damage to the page. So I'm measuring how big I need to make my little sliding tab out of polyester here. I want it long enough to extend past the bottom of the page and slightly narrower than the opening. So you cut your piece of heavy polyester and you need to round the edges and also sand them so that they're not sharp because you're, you're going to be sliding them in below the photograph and on top of the photograph. And it's amazing how much grit actually gets inside these albums, even though they're closed up. And if you have trouble getting these in, you can gently insert like a little tiny metal spatula just to help you get started. And you want to be wearing nitrile gloves because you actually have to touch the photograph. So you can see I pulled the tab back and the nitrile glove is a little bit grippy. So it lets me take the photograph out. And now I'm just going to dust it a little bit and show you what kind of information is available on the back. Isn't that beautiful? Now to put it back in, you basically reverse the process. If you were taking all of the photographs out of the album, that would give you a greater opportunity to really get out some of the loose grit and dust that may have gone in behind the window by reaching in there with a soft brush, um, you know, turning it at different angles. So you can see that it's really quite, quite a tight fit. So when you get it in there, you can feel that there is a cavity in there to accommodate the mount that'll kind of settle down into place. To position. But if the positioning of these is really critical, it, it's a good idea to document their location before you take them out. Okay, we're, their next category is called slots and pages. And this is a snapshot album that um, belongs to Olivia Permanis. And these, um, these are similar. These are unmounted photographs, but the principle is the same. There's, they are, there's pockets within the page. The page, the front and back of the leaf are partially adhered to each other so that you can slide those prints in from the top and bottom or sides. And uh, these would come, you know, manufactured with set, set sizes of windows in them. Um, let's see. And mounting slits. Those are generally used for unmounted photographs. And on the bottom, we've got there. Basically, those are just kind of uh, cut lines in the page where you could tuck the corners of the albumin print. So this is that's a pretty early example. On the left is an early 20th century one that was designed to hold postcards. So those are exactly sized for postcards. And the page would be cut on the the leaf would be cut through, but you were um, the slits were designed so that you could put a postcard on both sides of the pages using the same slits. And photo corners. This is just a funky design that I came across, really kind of elaborate photo corners, but they can be very simple. You can make your own out of paper or folded piece of um, polyester or mylar. And there's just, there's just many examples out there. They work extremely well because you can use a blank page and you can position the objects wherever you like. And um, there are, there's no adhesive uh, touching the object. Uh, ideally, you would have really high quality photo corners, but I've seen very little trouble with them over time. Uh, I was lying, but this is the last category. It's pocket pages. And they're in the three ring binder. Pocket pages are one of the greatest inventions for housing, for storing prints. Again, they're, they're not adhesive. Uh, they're very inexpensive. They come in a variety of sizes. Um, I have seen a, a lot of people tend to compile kind of um, their excess photographs in collections within them, but um, a lot of families use them for albums now, and they come with very decorative covers and a variety of a variety of formats. So we shouldn't just think of them as a way to rehouse things, but they could certainly be an original housing too. So um, prioritization for preservation. There's so many factors here. I'm not going to read through this whole slide, but you just need to think about how each of these 
albums as a unique object, so you have to honor the creator's intention, uh, their goals, yeah, their goals for the object, how they put it together originally. You know, they chose the album. They may have even chosen the type of pages and the cover and the format, you know, the positioning, and try to honor that. Um, you have to anticipate what the use is going to be in your collection, whether you're, you might need to reformat it, digitize it, treat it, or whether you want to display it or just make it available to researchers. And as part of this, uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about evaluating the condition, evaluating the condition. Is it still functioning to protect the photographs? Um, is there deterioration going on, active deterioration, uh, you know, from poor quality adhesives? passive deterioration, um, uh, potentially from, you know, mishandling, and also, you know, how many of these you have, how complex each of them are, and potentially the budget that you have available. So we're going to quickly go through all of these key factors of preservation environment, which is always the overriding factor with photographs. Um, that's the best place to spend your money and your attention, even with albums with all our complexity. Handling and access, housing and storage, reformatting treatment, and a little bit on disaster recovery. So um, storage temperature and relative humidity, we've got a lot of materials. Uh, we don't have international standards for all of the components, but we do for paper and for photographic materials and these kind of coincide in that you want to keep the temperature, ideal temperature cool. Uh, 30 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit is the range. Um, if you have color, if you see at the bottom, if you have chromogenic color photographs or some of the modern digital photographs, you really need to keep it in the colder range, which would be, that would qualify as cold storage. And humidity, relative humidity, the 30 to 50% is just fine, and that kind of accommodates all of the components. Photographs generally like it drier, but um, I know things like leather can, and parchment, other cover materials could be desiccated by very low humidities. And of course, you want to keep the fluctuations to a minimum. So this is just, just fairly, fairly basic um, preservation guidelines. I, I want to say a little bit more about cool and cold storage. There are large collections of, of bound materials, including um, books and albums, stored in cool and cold storage, mostly in cool storage. So um, cool storage vaults look very much like cold or freezing storage in terms of equipment. However, um, if you're going for cool storage, you can use things like um, underground storage and take advantage of the thermal capacity of that, um, which averages around 50%. 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, this is actually um, the tunnel entrances to caverns for the Anderson Library at the University of Minnesota when they were being constructed. The Library of Congress has high density storage mo mo modules for their book and paper based collections, including special collections, which would have some albums. And those are set at 50 degrees Fahrenheit and 30% uh, relative humidity. Um, what's interesting to me is that the volumes are barcoded here and they're stored by size rather than any kind of um, other, other order uh, because that really increases the capacity of that, of that facility. So one of the protective features of albums has been studied and documented by the Image Permanence Institute recently, and that is the um, ability of the text block to kind of buffer the environment for the contents. So the following graph shows the relative humidity data from the storage space in blue and from an electric sensor that's embedded in the middle of the book, and that's the red lines. The data illustrates that fluctuations in the RH are barely noticeable at the core of the object. So you can see all those fluctuations in the blue line and almost no change in the red. So while the macro RH fluctuates between 50 and 70% daily, the RH does not in the book is does not change significantly. So I'm not this is not to say that you could take advantage of this and and put your objects in uncontrolled conditions because it will eventually affect them. But it just shows that what everyone knew from the, the 
the dawn of the use of scrapbooks and bound materials in general is that it's really protective of the contents, whether it's printed, printed text or, or it's photographs. I'm going to say a little bit about light. Um, you know, we've seen that albums are composed of a range of materials and not just the photographic contents. And <laughs> this is just, this is kind of a hyper example, but you can you can you need to understand that everything almost that everything can fade um, in a, in an album. The interior contents, the exterior. So you, you really need to be conservative. Um, I adapted this table from one that's on the AIC scrapbook wiki page, and I, I give you a link to that later. I like that it just includes not the photos, but all the inscriptions, the contents, the leaves, the covers. The light levels and durations are approximate along the bottom. Um, more detailed information is available based on photographic processes from other sources. But what is really important to absorb is that most of the photographs compo uh, components are very to moderately sensitive and mostly very sensitive. So you need to keep this in account if you were to um, be using these for a long period of time for exhibit or even for research. So in general, you need to filter out the ultraviolet light wherever they are used or displayed by using a glazing and window coverings. And you also need to reduce the overall exposure. Like I said, by just having things in housing keeps them in the dark. Um, evaluate the lighting that you use during digitization is another thing we don't often think about in addition to uh, turning the pages during an exhibit so that every page gets like less overall light exposure. Um, handling. Um, the glove issue is different for photographs uh, than for other materials. Fingerprints are forever and they often showed up as fading over time. You can't, once you touch something and you transfer that, the salts from your fingers and oils, you can't get them off. So disposable nitrile gloves must be worn if you are touching the photographs. Um, these gloves are also handy if the object is very dirty, molding, or the cover has red rot. Clean dry hands with no hand lotion are acceptable for handling the remaining portions of an album. The sensitivity of touch can reduce the chance of physical damage to weak and brittle materials, which is what paper conservators and book conservators have been telling us. So I have this video that I really like from Harvard, um, <clears throat> Harvard Special Collections. And while it addresses books, the same goals and handling procedures apply to albums. Also, it works to put a little bit of a break in my talking. So I'm going to start it, and then I'm going to go fo forward to the section that I prefer. Okay, so I, ho I hope you like that. They do a nice job. I, um, uh, Leah has shared the link so that you can watch the whole video if you like. Say so there's not much on the internet uh, for handling um, albums. So I was hoping to be able to show you more, but I think that that's a really good start and maybe you can create your own. So accommodating the binding is really, you know, albums have uh, materials issues and they've got, you know, brittle and weak and acidic components, things potentially loose, but the, the overall key issue is that you have to accommodate the binding. Um, clearly, as we saw in the, the history of binding structures, they weren't designed, bindings, books were not designed to hold a lot 
of heavy material like mounted photographs, board pages, photographs on mounts, um, tin types, whatever, uh, additional materials, and they're very stressed. Um, and they don't always open, the design isn't always uh, successful in that they don't always open flat. So you really have to think about the binding and uh, its vulnerabilities when you're handling it. So one of the things, key things is that they often don't open flat or to 180 degrees. So you can cause you know, serious and sometimes irreparable damage to the spine if you try to do it flat. In fact, the angle of opening, which this is called, is included in conservation records for albums. So if you don't have a photocopier of this type, you can use a camera or your phone while the book is held in a cradle. Uh, as the video stated, you want to use tools to hold the album open for you. Book snakes come in a variety of widths and hence weights. You can make your own or purchase them. Wide straps of a soft inert plastic, here polyethylene purchased in a roll from Benchmark, can be used to hold the, the boards or bulk of the text block. In the sling method, the straps are, are um, looped around the book, but then attached to the back of the cradle. You want to avoid putting anything on top of the photograph or contents in the album. And I'll quickly go through this. These are book wedges, cradles, and mounts that you can purchase. And as the video just told us, it, it's um, if you've got powdery book covers, red rot, you probably want to use something that's not porous, like one of these acrylic stands. Um, a book cradle supports the boards and spine at an angle that is um, opening that is appropriate and safe, and also supports the whole book if possible. Um, a pitch stand needs to have a lip to keep the um, object from sliding off, and if it has like really elaborate straps or clasps, those furn the furniture that we saw earlier, the middle furniture, those also need to be supported. And not to, don't get discouraged. There's You can make a lot of cradles yourself. Um, at the upper left, we have included the handout for that um, one that's made from mat board. You can use it from any kind of board. If you're using it short term, it doesn't have to be super high quality material. Um, you can easily make one from blue corrugated board. Uh, and at the upright, you can use a pillow. And that has the, I mean, I have done this, and that has the advantage that you can use a cover and machine wash it and replace it when you need to if it's getting dirty to protect so you can protect the books. So we're going to talk a little bit more about housing and housing materials. I just want to say quickly that we do have international standards for housing materials and they're they're very strict. ISO uh, 2013 and two I mean sorry 18902 and um, 18916. I've given you a lot of details about their requirements here, but the basic thing that you need to know is to buy your materials from a conservation supplier who has performed the photographic activity test on it. So this standard applies to everything that's in direct or close contact with photographs, um, sleeves, mats, um, interleaving, including adhesives and all of the possible materials, paper, plastic, paperboard, metal. Um, they all, all these need to be chemically and physically inert, and they, um, you want to use, one of the key things is if you have sanotypes, use buffered paper. That's a question people always ask me. But they're a little bit more lenient on albums, and so if the albums are not in direct contact with the photos, they don't need to pass the PAT or meet all of these criteria. It's a little vague, but I think that gives us some leniency because it is hard to find albums that where every component meets the photograph, photographic activity test. And certainly the cover doesn't need to, it's really the, the leaves that are um, the key. Here's just some examples of catalog pages. This page from Talus um, gives extensive details as to the quality of the paper and say how it meets three different standards. But really this is more what you typically would find and it, it provides all the information you need. Hollinger Metal Edge is another very well regarded supplier and we do one of the handouts is a supplier's list and it says at the bottom of the page that it passes the standard photographic activity test. So as long as there are no that gives you other details, but as long as there's no like other um, 
warnings, warning signs, I think you'd be very safe to order these clamshell boxes from them. So housing and storage, I mean, we all like to have everything look beautifully organized and kind of Martha Stewart-like in new containers, but it isn't always necessary. I mean, we do want to have things that are good quality and not, and not going to have a negative impact on our um, albums, but uh, you don't need to have everything look <laughs> look that look this good. The keys are that you want that you want your housing to function well. Um, ideally, you want to have every album in an individual box and stored horizontally. I mean, just we're talking about how the, the weakness in the binding, um, like if you store a text block vertically, you store an um, album vertically, the text block kind of sags because it's smaller than the covers. You can see how that would be damaging. So you really should store, store things vertically only if they're small, they are intact spines and solid bindings, or they have decorative hardware that could be damaged by something being stored on its side. But overall, you want to store albums um, horizontally. And if you need to put multiple ones in a box, kind of have a minimum of, of two of them in there. So when I say boxes, these are some basic styles that you can obtain or you might want to consider uh, the, the drop front two-part box, a phase box, and a clamshell box. Um, the clamshell box is similar to the two-part box, but they're connected. So you can often buy, you can buy versions of all of these in standard size, commercially available. You can always make them in-house. And for some things, uh, you have options to purchase them or make them yourself. So I just want to show you up front. Here's an album in our study collection. It's in a quality drop side two-part box. And you know, there aren't boxes that fits. Uh, albums are not standard sizes the way boxes are. Boxes are usually sized for photographic or paper materials. So you need to fill that extra space, some kind of filler material. You can use uh, pieces of some, anything that's inert. And here, these are little rolls of scraps of Valara tied with twill tape. They work very, very well to cushion and uh, fill the extra space. You could use scraps of blue board or matte board or um, a photo safe tissue. This is a box that the Conservation Center recommends for clients um, because they provide a custom fit at a moderate price. You can get a corrugated or solid core material that's acid free and um, pass the photographic activity test. Um, they have other um, formats than, than a clamshell box too, but this is what we use most of the time. And so you measure your book, which you measure your album and then you input the information and send that to custom manufacturing and they ship you back the box as you can see at the upper right flat and then you fold it and put your object into it so this is a clamshell box but it's a micro corrugated board it's very reasonably placed you can apply your own label to it you can get it almost any size. Um, this is just an example of what we think of as a typical book box, which is a cloth covered clamshell box or drop spine box. These are beautiful and a lot of, you know, may have objects in your collection that really need this very sturdy box. Um, often can be a very beautiful box with a perfect fit for your object, but it's very expensive because it's handmade. And here's an example of how we use four flaps. So four flaps are don't provide a lot of support and are useful for very thin or small albums if you're storing them vertically. Um, you can make four flaps, which is an advantage, and sometimes you can buy ones that have adjustable sizing. But we tend to use them at the Conservation Center more to um, secure a fragile item or group of items within a box. So here are the pages of the album for this. Um, this album were placed into folders and the cover was uh, placed into a four flap and then the folders and four flap were, were both stored in a custom clamshell box. So the, although the object was disassembled for various reasons, everything was kept and stored together. Briefly talk about interleaving. Here's just an example from our study collection. Um, interleaving started in the West to prevent the transfer of ink from engravings to uh, the other parts of books. Um, it's traditionally tipped in, but can also be a full sheet that is held within a post binding. Um, it can be decorative, but it 
its main function is to reduce abrasion. You can see how glossy the photographs are in this case. And if they were rubbing to get against each other for a long time, the surfaces would be abraded. And here the interleaving's in good condition, but usually it's made from glassing paper, which becomes acidic and brittle over time. So I get asked a lot about adding interleaving to albums. And I think we've become a little bit more conservative about this, but sometimes it's really necessary and can be an easy and inexpensive preventive treatment. Um, you want to add it when you've got things that are facing each other that are being damaged. I'm just going to go right to showing you examples. So if you've got what we call reactive contents or materials, on the left are platinum prints. Uh, as a platinum print that has caused ghosting. So the print is on the right and the ghosting is on the left. Platinum metal, metal whether the image is image material, whether it is an image material or the toning in a photograph will catalyze deterioration of the paper that's in contact with it. And that's what, what we now officially call ghosting. This is a common reason that interleaving is added with photo, to photograph albums. However, there's so many other contents, as you can see on the right, that could be cause deterioration generally through acidity, even um, newspaper clippings. Tapes and adhesives are really problematic. Um, with age pressure sensitive tapes, the staining may be due to one of the components of the adhesive or the carrier. If you look closely within the yellow rectangle on the right, you'll see staining from the tape on the opposite page. Not only that, but the adhesive can ooze out around the tapes and um, cause things to stick together. Oh, and that's, we have here a really egregious example of blocking. Blocking can be um, caused by adhesives and causing things to stick together. And when someone forces the album apart, it can delaminate photographs. In this case, it's like pulled the emulsion off of the photograph on the right. Um, and it can also be caused by high humidity or water because um, the gelatin binder, which is the binder on most photographs we encounter, will become tacky and then just act as an adhesive and stick to the facing page or facing photo photographs. So I, I, you interleaving materials need to pass the photographic activity test, be non-abrasive, be like appropriate weight for the page. Um, here I have a piece of microchamber interleaving. Um, and they can be a variety of materials. You want to pick one that's going to be easy to handle. If you've got a really large size interleaving sheet, you want it to be heavier so it's less likely to get creased. Um, and one other thing is that for digital prints, if you know it's digital prints and um, not, not just ink, ink prints that were produced contemporarily, but more like, um, you know, inkjet prints, and and um, sorry. Uh, um, anyway, if it's if it's digital media, the interleaving needs should only be polyester film because these are extremely vulnerable to abrasion, and polyester film is smoother than all of the other papers, paper boards, and and folder stocks. You just have to be careful with interleaving. You can't use it indiscriminately because uh, it'll stress bindings. Uh, also you have to be careful overseeing people who are using it because they tend to get left out by researchers or develop handling damage, which can then transfer and affect your contents. So we've got a re reformatting here. So what does that mean? That means any kind of changes to that original structure of the album. Sometimes it's necessary um, and you have to think about how well is it going to help you to retain, to, to document that album, um, retain the information that's potentially getting lost as it's because it's damaged, and help to kind of reveal it to researchers. So the main ways that we, we do this at the, is to either digitize things and uh, provide digital images in some form, or as um, including bound facsimiles. So, you know, if, if there, you're considering disbinding and disassembling an object for whatever reason, there should be a discussion with all the caretakers and stakeholders regarding the intent of the creator, the value and condition of the objects and the contents in the constant context of your collection. We, we've talked a little bit about that. 
Albums and scrapbooks are often in poor condition, and if rebinding isn't appropriate, then the loose pages may need to be treated as individual objects and stored here, like in polyester sleeves on the left or paper folders on the right. And like I said, you can always store the pages or contents along with the um, cover in the same box. Um, reformatting can include transferring the contents to new albums. On the upper left, someone's made one with photo corners. You can see the little Mylar photo corners and um, Mylar cover sheets in a ring binder. That looks really great. So those are some examples of binders that you can purchase. Standard three ring binders. And on the bottom right is a box binder, which I love because it's, it's both the box and the binding at the same time and is very inexpensive. So you just have to, you know, understand what your reasons are for disassembling this album and creating it in a new album format. It, it's often impossible to replicate historic ones, so I think that's an argument against taking them apart. When you're digitizing things, albums, you have to remember that there could be preparatory treatment that could be um, time consuming and expensive, such as disbinding or removing photographs or stabilizing them so that they can be safely handled for digitization. Um, and then the capture, and I'm not going to go into details here, but if you have questions, I can put you in touch with our manager of digital imaging, Maggie Downing. Um, you need someone who's familiar with handling really fragile items like this and doing bound items. You might need specialized equipment such as this. Um, we've got, this is our um, book copying easel that has an additional cradle so that we can image things without um, having them completely flat. I'm not going to talk about this, but these are um, digitization guidelines, both from the federal government and also from ALA. And this is something that was very popular with our clients, is creating a bound facsimile. So facsimile being a surrogate for the album if you don't want um, to, to give it to researchers for whatever reason. We we make full color, double-sided, electrophotographic or Xerox prints that are bound in a cloth covered case binding with a spine label. So they, they are really nice. Um, they don't exactly replicate most photograph albums, but they do give you the experience of going through a bound structure. And, and they're, um, if they are a great substitute for researchers, most of whom were happy with seeing, a, seeing a, a surrogate rather than handling the original object. And you can get multiples for, for family members, which clients often take advantage of. So this is just a little bit more about how you would prioritize things for preservation. We're going to talk about evaluating the, evaluating the condition. So here is an album of tin types with some of the common structural problems that endanger the contents. The covers are loose, detached, or braided. The book block is just, um, you know, detached. Uh, there's a lot of, of dirt, but this is something that uh, a lot of the, this problems with this album can be addressed through proper housing or by limiting access, but it could also be, be treated. Um, environmental grime finds its way into albums due to distortions in the structures. Um, sadly, too much love may correspond to heavy use, resulting in fingerprints and other damage. So I don't generally advocate leaving grime in place because it is destructive in the long term, but any kind of damage can be seen as a historical artifact. So you really need to discuss whenever there's going to be an interventive step uh, taken on an object. And on the left, you've got those distorted pages where the dirt and pollutants have come in through the gaps. Um, but not re really reach the photographs, which is another protective uh, factor for albums. This is one of my favorite images because it really brings home something that I want people to, I want you to do some looking at your collection. So take the time to look at the album completely so that you understand where the, any deterioration of the photographs is originating. Um, are the prints inherently stable or are they be, being adversely affected by the page or contents? So in this case, two of the gelatin silver photographs are almost pristine so that the yellowing and fading seen on the left definitely originates in the photograph. It was likely poorly fixed or washed. Um, things that can be done to improve this situation could be adding interleaving, not exposing the page to light through display, and giving it the best environment possible to slow the deterioration in that print. 
probably that, I mean, the, the page looks like it's very brittle black paper. It may be producing a lot of fragments and dust, but it's the photographs still look great on the right. They're really, really sweet images. So another, another big kind of red flag is when contents are loose, there's the potential for physical damage as well as a loss of, loss of information and context. So if the page is stable, it's usually possible to reattach items. Um, if there are only a few photographs, they could be placed into enclosures between the pages or within the overall storage box. But if the entire object is fragile as it is here, I might consider disassembly and storing the pages and the photographs separately. But remember, you, there's going to be a lot of time involved in paginating the photographs and the pages and keeping their order. That's something that you always have to, you have to figure out a method to do that. Um, you might want to even reposition them on the page. You can see where they originally went and photo document that before you take everything apart. Too often pages are brittle and fracturing at the spine or binding. And they can usually be mended and the album reassembled to a greater or lesser extent, but um, all the factors in the object and its value need to be taken into account. So I've quickly, I've got a case study here um, that really kind of illustrates a lot of what I've been talking about. A client brought their family album to CCHA because of its poor condition. The spine was missing and text block in several pieces. They decide on stabilization to minimize the non-historic material being added and also to keep the cost down, which is totally reasonable. They wanted digital files of the full photographs front and back to show all the inscriptions and printing. Unfortunately, they asked us to take pictures to see the process, which and permitted us to use them for educational purposes. So we can show them to you now. The description in Rich, book conservator Richard's Homer report says full leather over sculpted rigid paper paper boards, gold and blind stamping on covers, milk glass bosses set in brass on both covers, two brass four edge clasps, upper partially missing, gilt and goffered edges. No sewing, 25 guarded leaves with stubs and cloth hinges. You also noted that there are gold printed borders around the windows on the laminated rigid paperboard album leaves. The contents are 49 mounted albumen silver prints and one engraved portrait of Gideon Wells, which you see here. The top paper lay on the leaves are generally dirty and torn. So the first step was remove all the photos and number them on the back with soft pencil. Surface dirt was reduced and on the photos and the delaminating corners and lifting edges of several were re-adhered. Um, the chair in this photo, you can see at the upper left was mended, but sadly, um, someone tried to clean it in the past while it was in the album and created losses in the varnish coating on this print. And um, so there's still, there's white spots now blanching. Oops, sorry, Let's get rid of that. Um, and the damage to the, this, this print of Gideon Wells could not be addressed during this project. So the cover and leaves were surface cleaned with sponges and a soft brush, avoiding inscriptions in the printing ink. Torn and lifting outer layers of the leaves were mended or re-adhered. The textile spine lining and end bands were released mechanically and adhesive reduced. Delamination to the leaves at the hinges were re-adhered. Tears to the back flyleaf were mended and are re-adhered with mulberry paper and the appropriate adhesive. Spine of the book block was consolidated with a layer of acrylic toned mulberry paper and the abrasions to the leather cover were consolidated. So the photographs were digitized and replaced in their original positions. The completed album, completed album was measured and then um, box ordered and the album is functional again. Now to the last preservation topic. I see I've just gone over an hour and this will take about five minutes and then we'll be at our Q and A. So, I'm jumping right into disaster response. Um, your institution should have a disaster plan with a section for albums, including details on recovery and prioritization based on their vulnerability and value. But right now, I want you to have an idea of what's possible should they get wet. First, contact a book or photograph conservator at, at the Conservation Center. We are always, someone is available through to answer your questions at any time, um, especially if you have an emergency and um, non-work off hours. So there are many variables that influence the recovery process and outcome. However, blocking and mold are the universal and greatest risks for water damaged, either damp or fully wet photographs. 
Um, I could say a lot here. This is one of the topics I'm very interested in. I have to say that gelatin turns into an adhesive um, when it gets wet, as I mentioned before. And if you let that uh, dry, it may grow mold, but it's certainly going to stick to things that are in, in contact with it. So um, the first step is if the items are wet and dirty, you want to hold the volume closed and, and um, rinse it quickly in cold water. The second step may be to disbind and remove the contents. Noting in your disaster plan whether a particular album is a high priority to keep intact will aid in decision making during this stressful time. Uh, you want to lift any material that's in contact with a photograph. Don't try to slide them out in case they are sticking. Rarely is a complete breakdown of an object necessary. The main goal is to prevent blocking and improving drying. So this simple method will work if an album can stand upright and the photographs are exposed with no interleaving or cover sheets. However, the airflow should be really gentle because the faster things dry out, the more likely they are to curl. Most albums would fall into this category uh, and take considerable time and attention to dry out. This really should be done by a photograph and book conservator. So if you have a water incident, like I said, don't hesitate to call us um, and, and bring us the objects is that, if that proves the best route. All photographs can be safely frozen as a holding step on the way to air drying. Depending on the number of items, the albums can be put into your home freezer, or you may need blast freezing to be done if you have like a whole pallet of albums. So you want to seal each album in a plastic bag, squeezing out excess air. Albums, albums can become soft and distort when wet, so place them on something rigid when, while you're freezing them. And freezing can buy you time to make plans and raise money. And when I say freeze drying, it is vacuum, not vacuum thermal drying. The latter involves thawing cycles that can permit photographs to block. However, you must know in advance whether you will be air drying or freeze drying. Some may not be suitable for the process and packing is approached differently. The key is to keep objects in the shape that you want them dried in. So they must be fully supported. And so you need to use um, sturdy volumes or binders can be stored upright and interleaved, but historic bindings should be flat. And that is the end of the main presentation. So I wanted to show you my favorite references. This is um, a range of publications on the history, preservation, housing, and conservation of albums. And this is the top item because this conference proceedings contain much of the basic information that I've been talking about is still relevant and it is free to download the PDF. And also, this is the, the AIC American Institute for Conservation wiki on scrapbooks. Um, much of it is relative to photograph albums and is very accessible, also free, and has an extensive list of references at the end. So, While we give everyone a moment to type their questions into the chat, I just want to reiterate that this was recorded and the recording along with a PDF of the slideshow, as well as those resources that Barb has mentioned throughout the presentation will all be sent out to all registrants within the next week or so. Okay, hello. Are you going to pose the questions to me? Um, Leah? Yes. Okay. yes, I will. We're just waiting for okay. uh, folks to type them into the chat. To give everyone okay, one. thanks. Yeah. I would say sometimes I, navigating the chat is, I mean, you get distracted by all of the interesting information and discussions there. Might not get find all the questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have our first question. Um, this is from uh, Michelle. Just to clarify, tin types should never be frozen, correct? Yes. So I should have said photographic prints. And that that is true. There, there are always exceptions. I mean, 
contact me if you have a water incident and I can talk you through it. That's part of my job description is to answer questions from the public. And I know a lot about this topic. I just wanted to throw it in there so that you had a little idea of what was what would be involved and how important it is to understand your albums and document them before something like this happens. Okay, next question from Kathy. What should we do with a collection of newly discovered loose photos? They have been stored on a table or in a box in a room with windows. The, they date back a long time. Should we scan them? Um, sure, you can scan them. I think I'm glad that you discovered them. Um, so this isn't an album question. Um, you can do a lot with them. If they're really dirty, you might want to use an air blower like I showed you or a soft brush if they look like they can tolerate a little bit of manipulation on the surface to clean them up. Um, put them in some kind of individual housing would be ideal, paper or plastic sleeves, and then put them all in a box. I mean, if you want them to stay in a collection, you might as well keep them in the same box or you might want to integrate them into the rest of your collection. Um, it, it's unfortunate that they've been exposed to the environment and to light for so long, but it's glad that you're you're taking care of them now. If you have further questions, you can um, email me. Yes, and in that that email with the recording in PDF, I'll also be including um, Barb's contact information as well as um, some contact information for some other folks at the conservation center that you all may find helpful. Yeah, we we can't. I can't. I can't do albums alone. There, we need a team, which we have here, which is really nice. Next question. Uh, we don't have any more questions in the chat as of now, but we'll give folks just another minute to sort of start typing them in because I know it takes a little bit. I see um, another one from Michelle. So should 35 millimeter slides in paper mounts be removed from the mounts? Um, probably not. Um, if this is an example where the, the color image on the slide is less stable than all of the other components, like the, um, the mounts. So really you want to take care of that first and taking it out of the mount isn't going to do what you need. They really need to go into um, cool or cold storage to stop the deterioration of the color image. Some, I have had examples where things were water damaged and they were kind of sticking to the mounts or the mounts were distorted, that would be the only case where I would take them apart. I'm really sorry, you can't show all show me the photograph albums in your collection so that we can discuss them. That's the disadvantage to this model. Um, we have another question in the chat, actually a couple more coming through. So the first one is, uh, could you do a brief review of what to use for tape or corners when using plastic sleeves? Um, mean for, for like photo corners. Um, you can purchase, you know, mylar photo corners and paper photo corners that already have adhesive on the back. Um, and you can use those to attach them to the new page and then just usually just slip on the cover sheet. I think that's what you're asking. You can also make your own photo corners and use like a little bit of double-sided tape on the back of those. You can buy um, it's number 415 3M tape that um, we use in conservation. You don't ever want the adhesive to touch the photograph, but you can usually configure it so that it's just on the back of the photo corner and doesn't touch the photo. Um, and paper is really soft, but Milo is really easy and shows you the whole object. Cover sheets, the most simple cover sheet, you can purchase pages that already have them on, or you can make your own. You can just buy a polyester L sleeve, which is sealed on two sides, and just slide it over the page. I've, I've done that to recreate cover sheets. Um, I'm sorry, I missed the last question. Oh, there, we actually have a couple more. So the next okay. one is, when digitizing photos in a magnetic album, is it better to remove the photos or scan while in the album? Um, I say to leave them in the album, you can, if you, it might help to get a better image if you remove a cover sheet and it's, the cover sheet is rarely stuck to the photographs or to the page so that you can't lift it off and get it out of the way when, when you're digitizing them. If you try to remove them, they might come off easily, they might fall off, 
but then it's often difficult to reposition them and they, they won't stay in without some other kind of adhesive or photo corner. So I'm, I'm generally about leaving them in and if they're stuck at all, sometimes they can't be removed without damage. Okay. okay. Oh, next question. Yeah, uh, we have some photos from the 60s and 70s of VIP visitors, for example, first ladies that are in frames with paper glued on the back of the frames. Should I leave them as is? Should I remove them from the frames and put in some type of boxes? Hmm. It depends on what you want to do. Do you want to, if you want to keep exhibiting them, you might want to improve the framing because the, um, the, it's probably glass or acrylic that doesn't have a UV filter in it. Um, that's the biggest reason to do it. Also, you can just kind of look in the frame and see if the mat seems to, if there's no mat, you might want to improve the framing. Um, if there's a window mat that looks like it's acidic and brown, it could be causing fading under or along the edge of the photographs. But, um, but you have to decide what your goals are. You can also image that through the glass and get a, make a new print for some other purpose because reframing our, um, to conservation standards can be expensive. Okay. Um, so this looks like this might be our last question. For the beginning, the albums with magnetic backing and plastic cover sheet, the photos are stuck to that backing. Is there a way to remove them without tearing the photo? Possibly not. It's a rubber-based adhesive. And as it ages, the bond gets stronger and stronger until all of the volatiles are gone and the adhesive gives up the ghost. It's just what happens with tape. It's the same thing with photo albums. Um, and with rubber cement, basically they're similar components and uh, a conservator might be able to do it with uh, using organic solvents, but you really have to understand the photographs and whether they are, would be safe with that approach. As a saying, I've, I've almost never, the only time I've ever seen damage caused by a magnetic album to a photograph is when they were early photographs, cyanotypes and um, albumin prints, which are very, very thin. So the adhesive literally came through the paper. But for the photographs we see in 20th century and 21st century magnetic albums, which are like chromogenic prints, snapshots, black and white prints, they are not damaged by the magnetic albums. It's more that the aesthetics get ruined or possibly the cover sheets are poor quality and you might want to change those, but um, they're, they're okay. They're not ideal, but magnetic albums are not as bad as we first assumed. And the last little tidbit here is just a follow-up to the photos from the 60s and 70s of the First Ladies. Mm -hmm. um, and the follow-up just says that there is fading and discoloration. So I didn't know if there was anything you wanted to expand on knowing that. Um, I'm assuming these are, if they're color photographs, that's just what happens to color photographs, unfortunately. The dyes are unstable, even if they're in the dark. And the only way to stop that is to put them in cold storage. And there's no conservation treatment that can improve that. Um, sometimes, like I said, if you digitize them, you might be able to do some image manipulation and get a better image. If they're black and white prints, it could be that they've had extensive light exposure or the components of the frames are super poor quality. So that's a hint that if they're black and white images and you're getting fading that you probably do want to improve the framing. So. Okay. And it thanks everybody. Like that is the end of our Q and A. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today uh, for our final webinar of 2021. And thank you Barb for such an amazing presentation. It was super informative. Uh, thank you. I'll enjoy today's presentation and would like to learn more about our other educational offerings, please check out dhpsny.org slash education. Um, we are going to have a whole new lineup of webinars starting next year. So thanks again, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.